a.m., respectively 8 a.m., and I think we should start. Mrs. Miller, do you give us a sign if we are all online? You have to unmute yourself. I'm so sorry. Yes, we can start. Uh, we have at the moment 73 participants. Uh, so I just give the floor to you. Okay. I would like to welcome you, our distinguished speakers and our viewers at the screens to the webinar Spaces of Memory. Let me first emphasize that it would have been a great pleasure to hold the event with you in person. However, what this form of event allows us to do is to invite you as viewers in Argentina, Colombia, Germany, Poland, and other countries to follow the presentations of our profiled experts and to question them afterwards. And this on a topic this is, this is gain, what that is gaining in importance worldwide in today's times of the democratic crisis, coming to terms with the past crimes against humanity. Because this is how we learn to recognize authoritarian tendencies and can counteract them. A visible proof of the horrific reality these developments can lead to are the scenes of crime. A nation's dealing with traumatic places, as Elida Asman calls them, is an indication of how a society recognizes civil and political human rights. If crime scenes are not protected against destruction and deterioration, if they don't become object of legal investigation, if a society expresses to survivors and victims, relatives, that they don't respect their dignity, their mourning, and perpetual pain in failing to treat these places with care, if they don't preserve these places as an immovable sign and proof of what has happened, then societies lack the clear commitment to their democratic constitutions. At the Elizabeth Kiesemann Foundation, we are promoting the transnational dialogue about different approaches to coming to terms with the past. At our last international symposium at the University of Buenos Aires, it became obvious that national societies deal differently with past experiences of violence in their countries. In Argentina, 38 years after the last dictatorship, the unconditional demand for truth and justice is exemplary for the region and the basis of a comprehensive legal process which shows clearly where the priority lies in the handling of places of past violence in Argentina. In Colombia, an equally unique complex peace and legal process is attempting to heal wounds and the ruptures in society. Poland faces the challenge that German perpetrators abuse their country as a crime scene and that Auschwitz has become today a symbol of international warning and remembrance. After decades of suppression and neglect in legal processing, Germany is dealing with the lessons to be learned from the unprecedented genocide it has committed. Perhaps Dr. Elke Griglewski, Managing Director of the Lower Saxony Memorials Foundation, and former Deputy Director of the House of the Lanze Conference, might tell us later whether it is still possible today, 76 years after National Socialism, for us Germans to concretely face up to our own responsibility and to avoid the degeneration of memory into a reference to the foreign in our history without individual and real references. The different national approaches to coming to terms with the past become very clear how a society deals with its victims, with its perpetrators, and with their scenes of crime. Please allow me finally uh, some short organizational notes. Before each presentation, we will briefly introduce the experts in the work 
And due to time constraints, we have to keep this introduction short, but you can find further information about the speakers in our program. The presentations will be followed by the discussion during which you as audience will have the opportunity to ask questions in the chat, which will be hosted by the moderators, Professor Astrid Erl and Marcela Melo. I hope that the following two and a half hours will hold interesting contributions and enriching insights for you. And now I would like to hand over to Ms. Astrid Erl, who will introduce to us Alaida Atman. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks first of all to uh, Dr. Weidbrecht, Ms. Melo and your colleagues and collaborators for organizing this event, which will hopefully give, uh, give us interesting yeah, transcontinental perspectives on the questions of uh, crime scenes, spaces of memory and memorialization. Um, Alaida Asman needs no introduction. You all know her, nevertheless, I'll introduce her a little bit. She's a leading international scholar of cultural memory. And this is a concept which she invented together with her husband, Jan Asman, in the 1980s. She has received numerous awards for her work. And among the most recent ones are the Karl Jaspers Award, the Balzan Award, the Peace Prize of the German Book Trade, the Federal Cross of Merit, so that's the Bundesverdienstkreuz Erster Klasse, and the Erasmus Medal. Alida has written many influential books on questions of history, memory, and identity. And most recently, um, so a long line of books, I just mentioned some of the most recent ones, The Time Regime of Modernity, or Forms of Forgetting, a book on the European dream and one on human rights and human responsibilities. And just a few months ago appeared her newest book on the nation, why we fear it and why we need it. Alida Asman is both a scholar and a public intellectual. She's a voice that we can hear frequently in the public media with her interventions in discussions about the remembrance of the Holocaust, the nation and nationalism, collective identities. And these are interventions which always have the aim to create greater conceptual clarity and orientation. Alida Asman can look back now on decades of research on, uh, on cultural memory, on traumatic histories, and on the role of sites and spaces for memory. She has looked at memory from the perspective of ancient cultures, Renaissance England, or present day Germany. She is, or she used to be before Corona, a frequent traveler in the name of memory. And therefore she is informed about memory cultures all over Europe and across the globe. So she is definitely the person to address when looking for a comparative perspective on traumatic spaces of memory. And this is exactly what her presentation will be about today. So the floor is yours, Alayla. Alayla, you need to unmute. <laughs> Thank you for these really kind and understanding words. I'm, I'm very honored to be part of this enterprise, not the least because my parents were close friends of Elisabeth Käsemann's, Käsemann's parents. And in 1977, when <clears throat> these shocking news came across the, the telephone from Tübingen to Heidelberg, I was really there and I, I was um, uh, shattered. Uh, the same way my parents were when they <clears throat> shared the mem memory about Elizabeth. Now, <clears throat> my topic is uh, the memory, to, uh, first of all, next slide, a memory of places. Next, uh, um, and once again, the next slide. Great is the power of memory that resides in places. This sentence comes from Cicero, the classical master of Roman rhetoric and the art of memory. 
In this case, however, he did not refer only to language or the tropes or topoi, but to real places, namely that of Plato's former academy close to Athens that he visited actually three centuries later. Arriving at this historic site, he experienced all <clears throat> the knowledge and images that he had stored in his memory. All this came back to life. He enjoyed a reunion with his philosophical heroes and felt their presence. Although a direct access to the past is of course impossible, Authentic places can stimulate an imaginary presence of a past, triggering memories by a strong appeal to the senses. In calling such places <clears throat> marked by specific events as <clears throat> authentic or historical, we distinguish them from neutral, public or symbolic spaces. There is indeed a long cultural tradition of marking such places where important events happened and to single them out for monumentalization and memorialization, such as birthplaces of political leaders and cultural heroes, battlefields where decisive victories were won or lost, places of martyrs and miracles. Such places are framed by narratives that project a positive cultural message into the future. Even if these stories have to do with violence, suffering and loss, they preserve a positive message about incredible faith, strength or power of exceptional individuals. The spatial practices of pilgrimage and tourism arose from the attraction of those sites which were believed to retain a special aura. Next slide. Religious and national uh, memories are soaked with blood and sacrifice, but they are not traumatic because they have a normative quality, are incorporated into a positive self-image and endowed with collective meaning. Places of trauma, <clears throat> however, differ radically from other historical sites because they block the path to such an affirmative narrative. The defining feature of the place of trauma is that the story is not easily told. It is hidden and remains secret and silenced for various reasons. Psychological pressure, power relations and social taboos prolong this silence that creates a repressive protection shield around such traumatic sites. To distinguish now, next slide, between normative and traumatic sites, we may introduce here Proust's terms, uh, voluntary and involuntary memory. While the voluntary projection of memory into the future creates an afterlife in cultural memory, involuntary memory responds to an unsettling aftermath of traumatic events. This opens up an altogether different dimension of time. <clears throat> The time of trauma has been defined as a past that does not pass. Trauma is a psychic wound and injury in individuals and communities that time cannot heal, dissolve, dissolve or weaken. It warps time and chronology, leaving a black hole that disrupts the linear flow of time. Instead of disappearing with time, Trauma produces periods of latency after which the past suddenly returns and invades the present with undiminished impact. Next slide, please. In Germany, for example, the traumatic memory of the Holocaust started to resurface only after a period of latency of four to five decades in the 1980s and 90s as the unacknowledged aftermath of the Second World War. It had been given a name already back in the 1960s, namely the Holocaust, but it had not yet found a place either in Germany's political system nor in the general consciousness of the society. The term memory culture refers to a new form of collective memory that slowly emerged in the 1980s in response to an event that had been forgotten, dropped, silenced, and 
eventually returned with a strong effective impact. Next, please. A paradoxical <clears throat> um, sentence often repeated at the time was, the future, the Holocaust recedes into the past, the, the further it recedes into the past, the stronger becomes its impact in the present. In the wake of the international recovery of the memory of, uh, of the Holocaust, the task of taking responsibility for crimes against humanity in the course of one's own national history has spread also to other nations. While there are no direct links between the history of the Holocaust and other events such as slavery or colonialism, next slide, <clears throat> please, <clears throat> The discursive framework and language was taken over as a template to articulate also other historical wounds and traumas. This cumulative, cumula, um, cumulative effect caused a shift in the history of national and collective memory from a voluntary to an involuntary <clears throat> national memory, from triumph to trauma, from afterlife to aftermath, and from heroic to post-heroic narratives. The new memory of um, the new memory culture was engaged in recovering a previously ignored or denied historical truth with various means such as, and here come the various <coughs> uh, possibilities, as the help of archival documents, historical research, historical commissions, and most of all, with the help of historical witnesses and their oral testimonies. Next slide, please. The ultimate paradigm of a traumatic site is the concentration camp that the Nazis established in Poland near Osvietzim. Since 1979, Auschwitz has been included into the list of World Heritage Sites. This meant that the term heritage, usually related to voluntary memory and afterlife, now also includes the negative legacy of an infamous site of systemic mass extermination. It is difficult to capture this site in the available category. Next, please. According to Jonathan Weber, we have no category in our language to describe what this place is. We can only approach this place via negations. It is not a museum, even though it seems on the surface to be a museum. It is not a cemetery, even though it has some features of a cemetery. It is not just a tourist site, even though it is overflowing with tourists. It is all these things at once. For the first Polish inmates, the place provides the evidence of their shared national suffering. For Jewish survivors and their children who come there to mourn their loved ones, it is above all a cemetery. For those who have no personal links to the millions of victims, Auschwitz is principally a museum which presents the crime scene by way of exhibitions <clears throat> and guided tours. For the priests of the church, it is a scene of saintly martyrdom while heads of state use it as a platform from which they deliver their public confessions, admonitions, declarations. For historians, again, Auschwitz is an archaeological site and archive that retains the traces of the past. The place is everything one seeks from it, knows about it, and associates with it. The time has passed when governments try to transform places of trauma like Auschwitz or Buchenwald into memorial sites with a clear <clears throat> symbolic choreography and a political message. When the varnish of official meanings cracks, the mass of variegated and sometimes irreconcilable memories can appear. Next, please. In her book on the origins of totalitarianism, Hannah Arendt referred to the strand of ignored and, one more, um, to the strand of ignored <clears throat> and, um, and recovered traumatic violence as a subterranean stream of Western history. 
The most widespread trope for this shift from afterlife to aftermath, however, has not been that of geological layers, but the figure of a ghost and memory as haunt haunting. Starting from the 1980s, there is a widespread and even overwhelming interest in contemporary texts and films staging ghosts, phantoms and specters. The trope of the ghost, which had been popular in romantic poetry, Victorian novels and folklore tradition, was revived and found a remarkable resonance. Theorists have also picked up the new fascination with ghosts and elaborated its concepts, such as Derrida, who wrote about hauntology, thus mingling the terms ontology with haunting. In cultural studies, this prominent interest in ghosts materialized in the so-called spectral term. Ghostly knowledge, writes Avery Gordon in Ghostly Matters. Well, not yet, please, get, just come back. Um, <clears throat> Ghostly knowledge, writes uh, Avery Gordon, uh, stands for alternative stories we ought to and can write about the relationship between power, knowledge, and experience. And the point is on alternative stories in order to explore a troubled relationship between the living and the dead. And now the next slide. I am longing for you, Jew, is a graffiti message that the artist Rafal Betlejewski has written on many a public wall in various Polish cities using walls that are often covered with anti-Semitic symbols and slur. With his exclamation, he is addressing not Jews, but their ghosts that are haunting his fellow Poles. These forgetful contemporaries, he holds responsible for an ongoing latent anti-Semitic and exclusionary spirit. In referring to the disappeared and missing Jews in the Polish public consciousness, he is given, giving expression to a sense of haunting in the Polish community, trying to unsettle a nationalist narrative that is focused solely on a victim identity and is strongly rejecting unheroic feats about Polish collaboration. Next, please. In another way, the artist Gunther Demnik has appeased the ghosts of the dead by creating his stumbling blocks, Stolpersteine, thus materializing the absence of six million dead Jews and other victims of Nazi. Uh, Germany. Instead of prolonging the silence and taboos about them, these markers of the Nazi crimes in German and now also European cities create awareness, knowledge, and empathy. In the aftermath of excessive asymmetric violence, traumatic places release ghosts and create a sense of haunting, but new memorial practices can also respond to this demand and can bring the excluded back into social discourse, consciousness, and memory. Next, please. When in the dictatorships uh, in South America, the state-sponsored violence turned against its own population, this opened up a new chapter in the reimagining of spaces of traumatic violence. Enforced disappearances leave no visible trace. And here I cite this wonderful book by Estella Schindel and Pamela Colombo. They do not modify space in a manifest way. This clearly contributes <clears throat> to the haunting effects of the spaces in the aftermath of the crime. Not only concentration camps, but also places of detention are extraterritorial zones where, I quote them again, the state of exception begins and the rule of law is suspended to allow for an unlimited expression of sovereign power. Under these conditions, the spaces designed for destroying the individual's subjectivity are turned themselves into an instrument of torture. No wonder that the figure of the disappeared has been linked to the next speed, please. That the figure of the disappeared has been linked to the trope of the ghost in order to break the repressive silence and to create new imaginative languages of art and practices of memory. This is what Astrid Erl calls traveling 
memory. Once developed, languages and tropes can be used in different contexts. An example is the Latin American discourse on the figure of the disappeared that had a strong influence on Spain when wrestling with exhumations in the aftermath of the Civil War. Next, please. What is now the future of a traumatic past? Sites of memory differ from monuments, memorials, and rituals in that they are never congruous with the meaning given them in retrospect. They are occupied, modified, qualified, and resignified in a permanent dialogue between the material infrastructure and the social discourses. While cultural symbols may be pulled down <clears throat> and exchanged, places cannot be equally made to disappear completely, even in a new geopolitical order. Next, please. The new memory culture attached to traumatic spaces and the experience of terror is framed by a human rights paradigm that emerged as a political movement in Argentina with the demonstrations of the mothers and grandmothers on the Plaza de Mayo in the 1970s and 80s. This movement found its continuation in the Arab Spring, in the Tahrir, Square in Cairo, in the Gezi Park in Istanbul, the Maidan in Kiev, the Black Lives Matter movement in the USA, and last slide, <clears throat> the Sunday revolution of the women in Belarus. It has dropped political ideologies in exchange for new concepts such as trauma, witnessing, testimony, respect, responsibility, or empathy, and not to forget remembering. Remembering the victims of state terror is in itself a powerful political tool for preventing the impunity of a criminal government and for repairing the social fabric. If built into the political institutions and consciousness of the citizens, we may hope that such a self-critical memory has the power to deepen the civil structure of the state and to enhance the democratic spirit of the society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alaida. Uh, I, I give over to Dr. Weidbrecht. You have to unmute yourself. Of course. <laughs> I'm sure that happens to everyone <laughs> once, by the maybe now. Um, well, um, I would like to thank you as well again, and uh, it was a great overview of uh, um, the immense um, uh, diverse um, forms of uh, memory culture and memorizing traumatic spaces and places worldwide. Uh, I would like now um, to introduce um, uh, Elke Griglewski. Um, with great pleasure, I would like um, to present her. She's Managing Director of the Lower Saxony Memorial Foundation in Germany. In this position, she's responsible as well for the National Socialist Concentration Camp Bergen-Belsen, in which Anne Frank died. Uh, before she was deputy director and for many years head of the education department of the memorial site host of the Wannsee Conference in Berlin. She is known for her international work in the field of memory culture, especially in Latin America. Please, Ms. Griglewski. Thank you very much for the invitation and for this kind introduction. Next slide, please. After liberation from German fascism in spring 1945, the survivors of the Nazi camps and Nazi terror swore that never again similar events should take place. Within the legacy of the never again, the Nivida, the Nunca Mas, the historical sites were attributed in the long run a crucial role. Here, visitors should be confronted with the atrocities 
be affected by the shocking images and leave the sites with the inner conviction to never again let these things happen. Directly after the liberation, the Allies followed this idea by forcing the inhabitants of towns and villages in the neighborhood of former concentration camps to visit the sites and witness the piles of dead bodies. Next slide, please. Then the places were forgotten. They were often used as living space for Germans coming from the East and only the survivors were the ones who in the beginning or late 40s, beginning of the 50s, started to ask for a creation of memorial sites. In the very beginning, their aim was to commemorate. Next slide, please. When the federal government took over responsibility for these places, and this was in different stages, Dachau 64, Neuengamme 70s, etc. The focus was the suffering of the victims, which in one way in the former concentration camps was logical. On the other hand, crimes seemed to be committed without perpetrators. Next slide. Places where the question of perpetration can't be avoided were established only starting of the late 80s, beginning of the 90s before these places were used for different purposes, ignoring that what it meant for the survivors and their families. Next slide. Today, Germany has a differentiated and diverse landscape of memorial sites. On this map, you can see just big memorial site. Establishing more and more sites the question of sites as educational places grew more and more, became more and more important. Next slide. In the beginning, the idea again connected to what already the survivors had thought, that this history should never again happen. And the, the idea was to implement this through education. And you could mirror it in the first exhibitions in these places. Images of naked women before mass shootings, piles of anonymous bodies, pictures with the aim to shock the audience in order to make them sensitive for a never again. Next slide, please. In former concentration camps, it was very popular to bring school classes, put them into a so-called film room and show them films of the liberation of these camps. Many youngsters in this decade, in the 70s, came to the conclusion that never again they wanted to be confronted with this topic, not with the conclusion that never again this should happen. Next slide. Related to this educational idea that confronting youngsters with shocking images could help educa education, Related to this idea was the idea that leaving youngsters, very often it focuses to youngsters, bringing youngsters to memorial sites would change their attitude, for example, to right, concerning right-wing ideas. It was like the idea, if you bring them, the visit would change their attitude and they would leave the place with a complete new identity. Next slide. Especially since 1915 and the growing right-wing extremism and populism, there is a big awareness about the necessity of learning in former historical sites. What is important is that since 1990 or the late 1990s, the beginning of the 2000s, there is a high professionalism of educational um, personal in the historical sites and very reflective educational concepts. There is a awareness for the growing time gap between the visitors and the historical facts. There is a high awareness for the diversity of society 
and the necessity to relate the history of national socialism to other historical events, um, there is a high awareness of the need to relate to the living situation of addresses, and there is an awareness for an educational concept through human rights, means indifference to bring groups by force to historical sites, wanting to educate them how to be democratic, there is an awareness that visits to these historical sites have to be organized in a democratic way in order to make the participants feel how democracy feels like. Next slide. Historical sites are essential to gain knowledge as a fundament for commemoration. The history is not so far away as it seems to be. Knowledge is important as a fundament to understand today's structures in politics and society. If we want to understand how right-wing extremist groups function, we need to know how they worked in the past and where the continuing lines are, so to speak. Knowledge is important as a fundament to be sensitive towards actual forms of discrimination, understanding the continuity lines, for example, anti-Semitism and racism in Germany. That means that from a starting or con concluding from the starting point to take the historical sites for and never again, historical sites are today places with a very professional, knowledge how to educate about national socialism and the Holocaust. And if these visits are realized or take place in a professional way, then they can help very much or can contribute very much to a remembrance culture. Thank you. Please unmute yourself, Dr. Oh, okay, uh, maybe I better don't unmute myself. I'm sorry. Um, I would like to thank you very much, Ms. Grigalski, for this panorama of uh, the future of uh, memory sites, which is very important to realize that um, we have to change our perspectives and uh, that we need to um, integrate those places more constructively in uh, the work um, of human rights and democratic um, education. Now I would like um, to welcome um, and um, let me express, we are very honored to have uh, a representative of the Auschwitz Museum uh, on board. Um, this is um, Thomas Michaldo. Unfortunately, the deputy director of Auschwitz, Andre Kasorczyk, uh, is not able to participate today. Yesterday, um, we had the opportunity to exchange with him, um, but unfortunately, today, he's not, not um, able to participate. But we are looking very forward to the um, to the lecture of Thomas Michaldo. He is head of the department methodology, method, methodology of guiding at the museum um, in Memorial Auschwitz-Birkenau. He's responsible for cooperation with guides, training and recruitment of guides, as well as for the development of qualification for guides cooperating with the museum. Please, Mr. Michaldo. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the in invitation, and also I'd like to thank you, thank to uh, Professor Asman for introdu introducing uh, some things that I will be relating to during during my short short presentation. Um, first of all, uh, I'm ask I was asked to tell a bit more uh, on how traumatic spaces spaces like Auschwitz or uh, shaping the transnational memory and, and education. And I will try to focus on uh, two main things uh, today. The first thing would be how Auschwitz Memorial is able to 
shape the, um, uh, the memory of the, the Holocaust and of, of Auschwitz in today's Poland. And I will talk a little bit more about some worrying trends in the Polish society uh, in uh, relation of, of the memory of, of Auschwitz and, and the Holocaust. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, I will try to at least mark some uh, interesting trends that are also happening in, in Polish society towards the, the relationship uh, between uh, Poles or Poland and Germany and, and Israel, all with, connect, with the connection with, uh, uh, with the memory and, and, and the history of Auschwitz and, and the Holocaust. And uh, the first uh, remark or, uh, is that um, most of the views that I, I will be bringing here during the, the, the lecture are the views of really uh, right-wing extreme movements. But unfortunately, many of these views come also to the mainstream. And many uh, people are from, let's say, the moderate par part of the society also adopt these this, this views. And unfortunately, as, as I mentioned, some of them are uh, really present also in the, in the discourse uh, uh, of the main, mainstream. Uh, as it was already already said here, uh, Auschwitz Memorial can be seen as uh, quite a unique place as it was uh, created, opened as, as a museum, whether we can call it museum or, or not, but it was opened already in 1947. So we do stress the uniqueness of the place by saying that uh, uh, it is mostly authentic, uh, similar to, to Majdanek. Uh, and uh, it is very, very important for, for us to show and stress uh, stress uh, this to our, our visitors. Um, Auschwitz also become uh, quite early the, the symbol of, of the Holocaust. Uh, first of all, we think because of its authenticity. Second, also because of the number of the, uh, of the survivors who survived Auschwitz and, and Birkenau. And uh, as we know, at some point, their narrative on, on the Holocaust, in fact, become also kind of a narrative uh, 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 their narrative on, on Auschwitz became the narrative of, of the Holocaust. And for, for many years, uh, the narrative on, of Auschwitz was in fact uh, equal to the narrative of, of, of the Holocaust, which changed only, only, only later. Um, also today, the museum is trying to, 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 shape, to shape their memory, uh, whether it is uh, on the internet, using the, uh, the social media. Uh, we try to create what is called the virtual uh, com community of remembrance, for example, by, by using again our, our social media, but also of course by, by, by uh, different educational tools. Uh, generally speaking, we can, we can divide our education into two main streams. One is a very basic one, which are of course the guided tours. Uh, and uh, we have about 340 guides speaking 22 to languages uh, who were able of course, before the pandemics, to give tours uh, to about 1.7 million people a year. Uh, and that's the basic level. But we ha have also that in-depth level of, of the education, which are all kinds of um, uh, study visits uh, attended by about 20,000 people each, each year. Of course, again, these are the numbers from, from the time before, before the pandemics. But what is really important for us in, in, in shaping this, this memory on Auschwitz and on the Holocaust is to give um, our visitors uh, or the participants of, of our st study visit some universal message and some universal lessons. And as uh, it was uh, said uh, by one of the survivors of, of Auschwitz, Mr. Marian Turski, during one of the anniversaries of, of the liberation, we need to make people aware that Auschwitz did not descend from, from the skies, meaning that uh, Auschwitz was not the beginning of, of, of a process. It was rather the end of the process that was started with the hatred, with the hate speech. And uh, we really want to, to make our visitors and the participants of, uh, of our, uh, our educational pro programs aware of this, this fact. On the other hand, what is also very important for us, and we think this is also the way of, of the shaping of, of memory of, of, on, on the Holocaust, is to leave our visitors with the feeling of uh, anxiety. I mean, uh, we don't want them to leave Auschwitz feeling relief that they finally visited the place, that they, they learned some, some lesson. We rather want them to feel uh, a bit uncomfortable. And we want them to, to look around uh, their 
micro world and and to 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 check if uh, something wrong is not happening uh, around them because uh, as we know uh, it is in fact essential to react when we see that the evil is happening uh, uh, around us and we also know that for example all the international institutions like for example the UN um, can of course condemn uh, genocides that are happening uh, we have a very good example in, in Burma Myan Myanmar uh, just a few, few years ago but what is really important to stop them is to, to, to act on a very, very basic level. So that's why we want to feel our visitors a little bit uh, uh, anxious. Well, um, but our, our narrative on, on Auschwitz and, and the Holocaust, uh, unfortunately, uh, not always meets the expectations of some sectors of, uh, of the Polish society. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I must say that uh, some radical movements feel that uh, our approach is kind of a revisionist uh, and they, they want us to, to, to change it. First of all, because we are, of course, stressing the, 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 the fate of the Jews in a, in, a, in a camp. They believe that we do not stress enough, the, uh, and again, I'm relating to what was already said here uh, during the, the lecture, that we are not relating enough the suffering of the Poles in a, in a, in a camp. Uh, and because of that, uh, more or less for the last four or five years, uh, the museum is, uh, is, is been, uh, been attacked by, uh, again, all the um, uh, radical movements. Still, again, as I, as I mentioned before, also some more moderate par parts of the society take the same, the same narrative towards, uh, towards Auschwitz. Um, Auschwitz, of course, uh, shapes uh, the memory in turn also uh, uh, as I, as I mentioned, of, of the society, society but uh, I think the, the, the big problem is that um, the lesson pro, pro, from Auschwitz does not uh, lead to um, the feeling, at least not in all the, again, not in all the sectors of the society, does not lead to the feeling that we need to have a dialogue or, or to talk about the more reconciliation. But for example, in case of the relations with, with Germany, it's more and more raised that first, uh, the German state, today's German state, needs to uh, uh, make some uh, financial fulfillments for, 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 for Poland, for, for the crimes committed by the Nazi regime. And then only after that, we can talk about the reconciliation and, and to have some, some dialogue. And this is unfortunately this, this worrying trend that had started few years ago. I mean, it was, of course, present in, uh, in, uh, in the narrative of the, 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 the radical movements, but still it was not in, in, in the mainstream. Today, unfortunately, this is part of what is even expressed by the, by the politicians. Um, also, when it comes to the politics and the, and the politicians, uh, we've experienced in uh, the recent years that uh, many politicians come to, to the museum, to, to, to Auschwitz, I'm, of course, talking about Poli Polish politicians uh, uh, mostly, uh, just to show uh, to their supporters the, the, their patriotism and somehow to, to, to show that uh, they're trying to protect the, the museum from the external uh, uh, influences. Uh, they do not express it officially, but of course, those external in influences uh, are the Jewish or German uh, German influences. So this is a, this is a, these are quite a common common trends in uh, in, in Poland, uh, uh, unfortunately. Uh, it leads to to the collision of the memories uh, with uh, Germany and, and and Israel. I do not have time to elaborate it in more right right now, but I just want to. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Germany, just a few words about, about Israel. Uh, we have a big tensions uh, uh, right now uh, in, when it comes to, to, to the discussion and narrative about, about Auschwitz and the Holocaust. It all started about four years ago by quite an unfortunate uh, address by Israeli ambassador during the anniversary of, uh, the, of the liberation of the camp, when she referred to the Polish, uh, new Polish law banning the, the expression of Polish death camps. Uh, she did it during the, uh, uh, the anniversary of the liberation. It caused, uh, again, uh, a strong reaction on the Polish, Polish right. 
it of course uh, caused also the, the reaction on, on the Israeli, Israeli side. And we came to the conclusion, uh, we are um, talking about the uh, museum staff and also with our friends from Yad Vashem or, or other places in, in Israel that uh, those 20, 25 years of a good cooperation were unfortunately destroyed by one, one uh, bill, one law that was introduced a uh, few, few years ago. Um, I think I'll, I can elaborate more during the discussion. So uh, thank you. Thank you for now. Thank you, Mr. Mikhailov, for showing and presenting and explaining us the immense, difficult, and complex interpretation of Auschwitz and um, its, its role between the countries and, of course, the victim groups. And, um, well, we um, really should, um, as Germans, um, try to more step going more step ahead in um, supporting Auschwitz and Auschwitz. Um, we would like now to announce a 10 minutes break. Um, so we will be back in um, at 3 p.m. Um, uh, or it is then in um, in Argentina it's 11 and uh, in uh, Bogota or Colombian, it's nine. Um, and um, um, then we will welcome the, the, the federal judge, Tanya Vapikas. So we see each other in, in a while.
I'm especially delighted now to welcome the high profile Argentinian investigation judge Daniel Rafikas. Among others, he is responsible for the trials that bring to justice crimes against humanity committed during the Argentine dictator, military dictatorship. In this capacity, he has sent to trial almost 300 perpetrators and provided reparation and judicial, judicial recognition of almost 3,000 victims and has identified 50, 50 clandestine centers of kidnapping and tortures. Above, he is a member of several organizations, for example, of the Academic Council of the Holocaust Museum in Buenos Aires. Please, Daniel. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you for this invitation to the Elizabeth Kasseman Foundation. It's a great honor for me to, to stay here with all of you. Um, as you said, uh, memory sites in, in Argentina are a, are a milestone of the process of uh, judicial and political transition in my country from authoritarian past to a democratic present. Um, in the 1970s, as you said, a military dictatorship unleashed state terrorism against all kinds of uh, left-wing activists. The majority of the 30,000 uh, pursuits uh, were conducted to, to a special uh, secret facilities um, widespread all over the country, especially in the large cities of, of Argentina. Um, places that were hidden in, in military or security forces, warehouses, basements, barracks, places like that. Um, in Argentina, the name of these places are the clandestine centers of kidnapping and torture. Today, uh, many of them are demolished or vanished, but a considerable part of them still remains. And this one became nowadays a very important source of evidence for judicial investigations, not only to confirm the, the statements of uh, witnesses and survivors about their existence. But also because we learned that if the survivor of, the, of this clandestine center is able to return to the place, because this is absolutely depend on the will of the witness, if he is able to to return to, to the place when he was kidnapped and tortured or raped. But he, if he has this will, uh, for us as, uh, as courts is very important. Um, when, when he walks along the rooms, uh, he, he is in condition to remember more details and episodes to, strength, to strengthen his testimony. Um, this certainty increases if victims do this in group. We learned that if we invited two or three or four or five of them as a group, and we invited to, to return to the place where, where they were uh, tortured, they help each other to, to remember. And all this information is very, very, very important to, to our investigation. Uh, their interaction trigger rememberings and truth emerges with, with very, very concept, consistently. Also, it's interesting that uh, this kind of initiatives helps to the, to the moral reparation of victims, since they return to these places 
with the support of the state, with the companion of, of prosecutors, with the companion of judges, um, we, we learn as public functionaries that the victims made his way to a special, a special uh, way to, to, a, to a moral reparation. When he returns, when, when they returns to these places with the companion of the state. Therefore, clandestine centers in Argentina became a key issue in justice and truth process. And at the same time, they became centers of memory, of course, where new generations gathers to learn about the recently passed of mass violence. In conclusion, memory sites contributes in our experience, not only to justice process, to justice process and the seek of truth, but also to moral reparation and finally to memory work. And as an example of this, interac this interaction in between justice process with memory work, in this last month, my court is holding a, a kind of mediation among the Buenos Aires city mayor and the functionaries of the city with or in a discussion with a collective of victims of another clandestine center, clandestine center named Club Atletico. And the court is in the, in, the, in the position of mediation in between the city mayor and the victims. Be why? Because this clandestine center remains completely buried under 5 million of, um, of cubic centimeters of soil, completely buried, product of the construction of a highway as a result, um, uh, it, because in the place where this clandestine center functioned was removed and a highway was built there. As a result of these negotiations, the city last month assumed the compromise at court of eradicate this huge obstacle and next July, will begin the work of removing the soil in order to discover and recover this clandestine center. In addition, the city also took the compromise of build a memory center nearby because we have the expectation that the clandestine centers who was built in a basement, in a police center basement, will emerge intact. So for the city will be a very important place for conducting their youngsters and in, in, is, is, is located in the south of the city. And is a, I think that is a very, very uh, recent and present example of uh, the, the interaction of the work of courts, justice courts and functional, public functionaries of the state and collective of victims working together in order of, not only in order to obtain justice and truth, but also to obtain moral reparation for the victims and also, of course, memory work for the future. That's that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very very interesting the uh, actual situation in which Argentina is and the work to preserve the memory sites. Uh, I think it is a very special situation in which you are, and it is very interesting to accompany and to follow this. And um, I hope maybe we can after. In the aftermath of this um, conference of this webinar, we can um, intensify our relationship between the countries and so that we can exchange about the developments. 
Now I would like to hand over to Thomas Fischer, who will present. Um, yes, it's uh, now my great pleasure to introduce Tatiana Lewis. She is the author of our next talk. She is an associate professor of Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, which is the capital of Colombia. She uh, works at the language and culture department of uh, this university, and she has acquired a PhD in history. So she is a historian. And she did that at the University of Cologne. And uh, this PhD was about identities, identity construction of displayed persons in Colombia. Some of you might remember that within Colombia, there have been more than 8 million displaced persons. So what she did was research and empirical research, and in particular, she did research with the method of oral history. So she is one of the this, uh, persons who have addressed this difficult task to reconcile memory theory and practice. She put it into practice with this particular and very important method. Um, currently, she is working about the impact of memory work within the Colombian education community. So now I would like to give you, um, well, the opportunity to explain what your, the meaning of your title, which is Traumatic Spaces of the Colombian Armed Conflict. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this very kind introduction. And thank you very much, Dorothea Weidbrecht, for the invitation to this webinar. I hope you are already seeing my screen. Um, if you could just confirm that you are seeing my, my screen. Yeah, OK, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, yes, I am going to talk about traumatic spaces of the Colombian armed conflict, and I uh, called my presentation too many, too close, too far away. Um, my first reaction to the proposal of talking about topographic Colombian memory spaces was, we don't have such thing. This, of course, is not true. We do have memory spaces. After more than 70 years of an ongoing internal armed conflict, the country is full of memory spaces. But still, my guess is that a considerable number of Colombians would, when asked, give the very same answer that came into my mind. Obviously, we have here an indicator that the situation is a bit complicated. And this is what I am going to talk about during the next 10 minutes, why the situation is complicated, how it is complicated, and what are the consequences for the societies coming to terms with the past. Uh, yeah. In the panorama of dealing with the past, Colombia is a special case. Usually, a confrontation with the past sets in after a conflictual or traumatic period has ended. In fact, quite some time can pass before a society is ready to come to terms with the traumas of the past. In Colombia, however, we are still dealing with an active conflict. Although the world's longest internal armed conflict came to a much celebrated peace agreement in 2016, with the country's largest guerrilla group, the FARC, laying down its arms, Colombia is still in the midst of a conflict. There are still active armed groups. The number of victims registered with the state-run victims unit is rising daily and currently stands around 9 million people. However, the process of dealing with the past began already in 2005 with the law of justice and peace under which paramilitary groups demobilized and the National Center for Historical Memory has its origins. In 2011, with the victim's law, the state recognized its duty of remembrance and set victims right to truth, symbolic reparation and the guarantee of no repetition. To my knowledge, Colombia is the only case in which a traumatic past was not dealt with after the end, but during the conflict. And this means that the past is not a past. To many Colombians, it is a very painful present and immediate future. 
the number of potential sites of memory actually can expand daily. And who would know if there isn't going to be an important event in the future with the potential to stand symbolically for the conflict and the suffering of the victims. The map you're seeing here shows the places of massacres. Apart from the number of events, this map shows another aspect of the conflict. It is decentralized. Most of these events occur in remote rural regions that are poorly connected to the general infrastructure. It is difficult to reach them and the security situation often makes it inadvisable to travel there. <clears throat> However, despite the still ongoing violence, a lot of work has already been done at different levels. As early as 2008, the National Center for Historical Memory started to publish report on so-called emblematic cases of, of human rights crimes with a careful research on the reasons and development of the conflict. More than 100 reports have been published since and are available as free downloads on the center's website. In 2015, the Colombian Network of Memory Spaces was founded. It includes 30 sites of memory, of which three are state-run, and the rest is supported by the different communities. Although the network has only been in existence for five years, some of the individual initiatives are much older and can look back on more than 20 years of work. Now it is necessary to point out that most of these sites are not the authentic place where a massacre or a displacement has occurred. In fact, the network makes a distinction between representative sites and testimonial sites. Representative sites, which are, as you can see, the vast majority, are usually buildings or monuments erected to provide space for the commemoration of the conflict, to exhibit the history of the conflict, or to provide a meeting place for commemorative initiatives. They don't refer necessarily to a specific event, but to the violent history in general that can be caused by the guerrilla, the paramilitaries, drug dealers, common criminality, or the state. Testimonial sites can be the authentic place where a massacre took place, but mostly they refer to places where testimonies of a specific event are archived. Um, let's now take a brief look at two of these testimonial sites, Buhaya and El Salado. Both cases are well-known cases that were investigated by the National Center for Historical Memory as early as 2009. In El Salado, between 80 and 100 people were killed by the paramilitaries over several days in 2000. Many of these killings took place on the sports field in front of the church. The massacre was followed by a massive displacement of villagers. Two years later, the first returned to clean and reconstruct their village. In 2007, a monument to the victims was erected over the largest mass grave. In 2010, this monument was replaced by the so-called People's House, which is a place of remembrance, mourning and meeting. The massacre of Bohaya took place two years later, in 2002. There, during a battle with the paramilitaries, the FARC bombed a church where many people had sought shelter. At least 79 people died, 40 of them children. Here, too, massive displacement was the result of the fight. However, a large part of the population returned already four months later, not because the situation had improved, but because they could not make a living outside. In 2003, Augustinian nuns began rebuilding the church. The roof and walls were repaired. The floor, however, remained unchanged at the request of the victims' families. After the massacre, the survivors had been forced by the FARC to bury their dead in mass grave. It, was not, it wasn't until 2019 that it was possible to give the dead a proper burial. I believe Bohaya and El Salado are representative of many memory sites in Colombia. They are, despite the hesitant beginnings, part of the state's policy of remembrance and reparation. They have been investigated as emblematic cases by the Center for Historical Memory. In this way, they are intended to contribute to the clarification of the past and the construction of a historical memory of the conflict, as well as to the symbolic reparation of the victims. However, state aid did not come easily. The Colombian state had to be ordered in part by the 
court to acknowledge its responsibility. In both cases, there is an interaction between the demands of the affected communities for satisfaction and reparation and state activities, such as the intervention of the National Center for Historical Memory. For the development of the place, on the one hand, a community is needed that intervenes and is involved. But on the other hand, the state has to provide the social conditions that make such a development possible. Bohaya and El Salao differ from other places of memory because in both cases, the place itself plays a role. The floor in the church in Bohaya and the site of the largest mass grave in El Salado. In, in, in El Salado. In many other memory spaces, the symbolic meaning and function are transferred to another more central place. Because here in the place itself lies a limitation of the social impact it could have. Both Bohaya and El Salado are located far from urban centers in areas where the security situation is still not safe. Thus, they remain places of identification primarily, perhaps even exclusively, for the affected communities. This perhaps explains why representative memorial sites have a stronger presence than testimonial sites. It also points to the objective of the memory work in Colombia, which at the moment is less about the preservation of a place, but about the restoration of social fabric. The destruction of social ties, the uprooting of entire villages from their ancestral territories, the loss of cultural practices are among the strongly felt social consequences of the conflict. Memory spaces should therefore be spaces where one can grieve, heal, reappropriate cultural knowledge and practices, meet others to collaboratively construct the history of the community and the territory. These do not have to be historical places. In fact, any safe place is suitable. Moreover, if this work is to have an overall social significance, then precisely because the conflict is decentralized and in remote areas, the memory spaces must come to the people. Mobile concepts such as the sewing workshops in which participants process their experiences in tapestries not only invite victims of the conflict, but are open to anyone who wants to join in. Another example is the Museo Itinerante de los Montes de Maria. It is a mobile construction that comes to urban centers as a traveling exhibition, a concept that, by the way, the National Memor Memorial Museum has also adopted at least as long as there is no museum building. These initiatives receive a lot of attention, more than El Salado and Bohaya. At this moment, I believe that memory sites in Colombia face a triple challenge. First, there are too many, and the list is not even finished because the conflict has not ended. Second, there is a lack of temporal distance that would make it possible to decide which sites are particularly suitable for developing a potential for reconciliation of the fragmented society. Third, the historical sites are often remote areas and they are not safe. It is questionable whether at this point in time, people from Bogota or Medellin would be willing to travel to Buhaya, for example. But I think they should, in order to understand that this part of Colombian past and present is also a part of their own history. But as long as this is not possible, representative sites seem to meet the society's need better. And that is all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luis. Another example of um, an actual struggle to preserve sites um, at the first place for the morning and um, like, like, a, like a graveyard, I guess, um, for the people, for the victims, relatives, and uh, for the for survivors. Um, I would like to um, go in another break for 10 minutes. To open afterwards, then the discussion and the floor for Ms. L.
So now our, the author of our next uh, presentation is here, so we might may start. Um, I'm delighted to present Astrid L. Astrid L. is professor of Anglophone Literatures and Cultures at Goethe University of Frankfurt am Main. Her uh, research is very broad and it's about German, British, South Asian, US American and South American literatures and media cultures. In particular, this expression uh, media cultures is coined by herself. So she made a concept of it. And not only that, she also founded Frankfurt Memory Studies Platform. And uh, she has um, brought to us a myriad of publications. And I just want to mention the, one of the last ones, which is about cultural memory after the transnational turn. This has something to do with our conference. So Astrid, it's now to you. Thank you very much. So, hi everybody. Uh, my task is now for something around an hour. We have time really to have a um, discussion also with those who have been watching and listening so far. Um, it would be nice if you uh, put your questions into the Q&A or just raise hand via the queue and I by just uh, giving your name and perhaps sort of indicating the topic. Depending on how many questions we get, uh, Marcella Melo will help me uh, sifting through them and uh, finding those which uh, fit well with the current discussion. Before we start, let me quickly remind you and probably also those who, who could only come in later, we had a great program so far. We uh, listened to an overview talk by Alida Asman on spaces of memory and the various types and comparative perspectives. We listened to Elke Griglewski on Holocaust memory in Germany. We listened to Tomasz uh, Michaldo on Holocaust memory in Poland or in Auschwitz. Uh, we listened to Dan just now to Daniel Rafekas on the Argentine case and to Tatiana Lewis about the case in Colombia. My personal impression is that we got a fantastic range of very different types of traumatic spaces. So all the way from symbolic or representation spaces as Tatiana Lewis pointed out, all the way to uh, spaces that still seem to be very much tied to the body and to the past crime. So I was quite impressed by how Daniel Rafikas showed how these sites of past crime elicit the personal memory and how even collective memory going through the um, spaces in the group elicits even more memory. I make two more points before we open up for discussion. The first is, I got an, a sense that we have an interesting cases um, as far as time is concerned. So with uh, the Holocaust, we are now in the fourth generation. What does that mean? With Argentina, I guess we are in the second or in the third generation. And with Colombia, we are in a case where the violent past is still very much a violent present. So it's ongoing. What does this mean, these different temporal horizons? For example, for the form of address, for the, for the registers or modes that you can draw on when you want to convey these histories. And I found it interesting that uh, in Elke Griglewski's talk, I found this very strong emphasis on the professional dissemination of knowledge. So really knowledge, the cognitive seems to be very important here. Uh, Tomasz, on the other hand, highlighted that he wanted to uh, visitors to move away with a certain feeling, and that's a feeling of anxiety. So what role does the cognitive, the emotional play? What role does empathy play? And I think another light motif that I heard again and again is the role of youngsters or youth. So the big question of how to convey these pasts of violent sites uh, to a future generation, to young people in societies 
that are all, if not transitional societies in the strict sense, they are all transforming societies. Germany, of course, as well, transforming into a more diverse society, a more multicultural society, as Elke Kryglewski pointed out. So this is basically my little insight of uh, what kind of uh, brought these uh, presentations together. And uh, let's have a look at what people have come up with. Um, so, and there are not so many, I think we can really just go the way they came in. First of all, two questions to Alida Asman. The first is a very practical one. That book which you showed, could you show it again and tell us who the author is? And this, I, I come back, I already say the second question because then you can unmute yourself. And <laughs> there's a question by uh, Suganya from India who is asking, what about literary narratives or novels? Are they equivalent to historical sites in representing the traumatic past? Um, or are novels becoming obsolete the, uh, in, in narrating the trauma of the past? And perhaps we can even widen this question to more general questions of what, what's the relation to diverse kinds of media representations of the past? Okay, um, thank you very much, Astrid, uh, for these first uh, questions, but also for the very concise summary. I think that that is very helpful as a kind of compass for our discussion. And now I, I would like really to advertise this book uh, because I learned a lot uh, from the two authors. It's uh, Estella Schindel and Palema, Pamela Colombo, and the title is Space and the Memories of Violence. And it goes back to a conference that was, oops, the, I'll have to play with the background in order to make, not make it disappear. This is the book. Uh, it was also in Palgrave uh, Memory Studies. And um, it really addresses the topic of, of our uh, webinar, webinar in, a, in a very effective way. And it is also comparative, especially also related to uh, to Spain, but starting from Argentina and, and, and other places and also including um, Germany, uh, for instance. So it is uh, to be recommended. Um, the other uh, question I, I find very important because it refers us to um, dimension that we haven't really covered uh, today yet. Uh, perhaps if I may uh, give you my uh, way of um, co um, organizing the topics, I think we are uh, involving, involved here with uh, truth, that is uh, the domain of historians um, uh, and the investigation of historians. Uh, then with law, which has to do also with investigation, of course, but um, uh, in order to be brought to <laughs> Um, to law and to justice. And I think this is exactly also where the victims have to be located because they um, are the ones uh, to, um, <clears throat> who are uh, asking for compensation, compensation here. And the third dimension uh, was so far the society, namely the question, uh, what about those who live in this uh, uh, country and how do they uh, remember, especially if they come after the, the following generations. But culture was not really our, our topic here. And I think that's very important. Uh, and what you just asked, um, literary narratives, how can they be part of this whole <clears throat> uh, story? I think uh, they're very important. And the interesting thing for me is that literary and historical novels have fused uh, during the last, uh, in the last decade. And my example is um, Katja Petrovskaya. Um, and her novel is called Vielleicht Esther, perhaps Esther, and it is a, a literary piece, but at the same time, uh, travelogue and um, uh, autobiography, uh, autobiography of a family uh, story. And uh, so you cannot really delineate um, uh, the, <clears throat> the limits clearly where uh, literature ends and history begins. I think there's a new uh, combination of the two. And um, this is a development that I find very interesting. 
Very good, thank you. Yeah, my personal answer would also be that they, they are all part of plurimedial constellations that make these sites uh, thicker and thicker, yeah. You know, I, here's an anonymous question, but I think that might open up something very important, and that is a conversation among the panelists themselves. So I go on with that. There's a question of, is there any interaction or collaboration between the countries, between Auschwitz, Argentina, Colombia? Perhaps we would like to ask you this, uh, probably also with the question of, after having listened to your to each other's presentations, is there anything that struck you in terms of comparability or transferability of practices or concepts? Whoever would, I see that Elke would like to start. I think that, uh, first of all, a, a, a communication between the countries is very important because no country, no, nor Germany, nor Argentina, nor Poland, came to a point where we could say we are done. All of us are still in a process of learning and the international exchange is extremely important to learn, to continue learning um, about how we can deal in a productive way with our violent past. The second point is why I think um, cooperation is so very important is because there is a connection between the countries. There is a connection if you just if just to mention uh, all the former Nazis that went to Argentina after 45 to imagine um, the immigration restrictions against Jewish immigrants in the 1930s. So it's I think also due to the fact that we're speaking about a globalized society in world, it is important to look on this history, not in a national perspective, but in a global um, relation and the connections that exist between all the countries. Thank you so much. What about the other panelists? Is there anything that you would, Tatiana? Thank you. Um, what uh, Mrs. Griglewski just said, I, I think it is very important. And I think it is very important for the Colombian case, the fact that we never stop dealing with the past. Um, as we are so close in Colombia to everything that has happened and is still happening, um, we see some kind of a hurry of getting onto these things. And uh, sometimes I even have the impression that uh, in the whole panorama of transitional justice, we have some kind of checklist where we check things. We check the uh, Memorial Museum, we check uh, the National Center for Historical Memory. But um, the understanding that memory processes are process are long-term processes and are processes that have to come from the society that cannot be uh, imposed by uh, by governments or uh, by uh, politics that that come from from above um, I think this is a um, something very important to learn and something very important to have in mind that in Colombia we are only starting a process, a process that is going to take generations um, yeah, to, to come to terms with the past. And I think this is a very important message uh, despite the very individual difference between the processes between different countries. Yeah, yeah, thank you, very right long-term processes. What else? I think Alida would like to say something. You have to unmute, yeah. Yeah, um, there are of course um, causal relations between the different countries, as we just heard. Uh, perpetrators um, <clears throat> going to Argentina and so forth, but there are also structural patterns. And I think uh, it is impossible for a country to uh, do this memory work in, in total isolation. Um, on, the, on the contrary, what we can see happen is that um, uh, methods, patterns, concepts, <clears throat> whatever, uh, that were developed are eagerly picked up and used in another place. So this is why I refer to the templates that are, that are traveling to other places. 
and that they are used uh, not in order to enter a competition of victimhood, you know, enterprise. This is not the case at all, but to lend a language and uh, symbolic forms in order to express something that had been inexpressible for so long or to uh, gain attention, which is also very important, not just on a national, but also on a global level. So I think the interaction, the trans national um, and even uh, global attention to these things is, is very important and uh, has repercussions in the country. So it needs not only to be seen from the inside, but also, also from the outside. A short remark, uh, please allow, um, that we received just a question if um, Spanish questions are as well, um, if the, um, if the uh, discussion is open for Spanish questions, of course, of course, please. Um, the audience uh, in Latin America is more than welcome to um, participate in the discussion. We have, uh, Thomas Fischer will uh, translate the, the questions. Right. Um, is there anything else in this round of first, uh, basically, recognition of what the others are doing? Or should we go on with uh, the questions from the plenary? Um, we do have the possibility of, of bringing in people via video chat, and I wonder whether we should try to do this. Because the, the, in my Q&A, I now have a, a list of a bit longer questions, and it might be nice to see people rather than me reading them out. So I would like to ask whether Richard Vargas, uh, Kai Stratmann, and Hannah Katalin Grimmer would like to uh, come, come on via uh, video and uh, pose your questions. Please do remember that, that you ideally um, articulate them shortly so that we have short questions, short answers, so that many people have the possibility to come in. I can see, ah, Richard Vargas, can you, would you like to, to ask your question then? Yes, can, can you listen to me? Super, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for, very, for this very interesting presentation. I really like it. Um, well, I, I wrote in the chat um, about this question connected to site of memory, especially in Colombia, because because actually we have complete regions, you know, that have been affected for war, for the conflict. And I would say that the, this this conflict did, did not start a 70 or 50 years ago, that is the narrative that has been, you know, officially presented. I would say that it is started even in the 19th century between these two political parties, the liberal and conservative parties, who just fought not only for po political ideologies, but for uh, these colonized territories. You know, and that is started. So we have complete uh, regions right now, for example, that have been completely changed. Uh, can we talk about these uh, memory escapes, not to be just specifically memory sites, but memory escapes like these um, scholars such as Aaron Wea from uh, Liberia had, had uh, established this term, you know, memory escapes. And I, I would say that this is connected to what happened right now in Colombia in which uh, this the state or multinationals try to change completely the nature, you know, rivers, mountains to implement this mon monoculture. And they are displacing, you know, uh, peasants and, and inhabitants. So I would like you to, to comment about this, especially uh, Mrs. Uh, Lewis, um, that is connected to, to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, should I just go ahead? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for this comment, uh, um, Mr. Vargas. Um, of course, Colombian history is a history of violence, and um, you are perfectly right to say that the conflict uh, did not start 50 years ago, 70 years ago, but we have it like a, like a background noise, we could say, since uh, the time of the independence. Um, Still, when we talk about the conflict, um, normally we refer to the problems of the 20th and 21st century. Um, 
and I think uh, what you just said about memory scapes um, describes very well what is happening in Colombia. Um, the the map I showed where um, um, yeah, with every little dot uh, that was um, pointed out a massacre shows it very well. Colombia, the whole, the whole Colombia is a memory space. And um, I think um, that is what it makes so difficult at that point to say, okay, we have this important space uh, where we can project all our, um, our efforts of, of making memory. Um, but there are so many. I, I could take any any place. And as we are so close to what is happening, it is very difficult um, to decide whether one place or another or whether one region or another um, is more suitable to uh, be the, like the projection um, and the symbolic um, representation of the conflict. Um, I, I really think that in, in Colombia right now, we are at the point, we, first of all, we are too close. We are in a process that still has not ended, uh, where we actually don't know what the future will bring in terms of memory spaces uh, and memory work. And um, we are at the point where the society is negotiating um, these things. And as you said, um, one of the or, or amongst the important things is um, the discussion whether there is a conflict or not no um, obviously i am stating here or i am or trying to to talk about two very opposite uh, opinions um, of two very polarized groups but um, as long as we are still discussing discussing things like that um, I think we can see that we are still in a process that is far from coming to an end. I hope that answered the question. Super, thank you so much. I'd like to say two things. The first is that Elke Kryglewski also wanted to come in on this question, so the floor is hers in a second. And the, the second is that Marcella Melo will now start grouping questions a little bit to, to cases according to cases and countries. This is why some people are in the room here who will all address the Colombian case and we will move on from there. But first it's Elke Kryglewski. <coughs> Mr. Vargas, I think that the concept that you rise of the memory landscapes is relevant for all countries. In Germany, there is a big discussion on how having memorial sites, the whole dealing with the past is being delegated to them. There is a saying in German that goes, mistrust all the green plains, because you don't know what was there before. You know, and it's so easy for a society to say, yes, we have the memorial sites, but we don't have to do with the history of the, the, the crimes, et cetera, et cetera. So I think rising the idea, if we shouldn't speak about memory landscapes, has huge implications on the question of responsibility. It has huge ex um, re uh, implications for all the topics that are being focused right now just on the memorial sites. And Alida Asma. I just uh, would like to underline what uh, Elke Kudlewski just said. Um, I refer to Mariana Aberbuch, a Berlin historian, who uh, used to say, uh, the whole country is a monument. Das ganze Land ist ein, ein um, Denkmal. And uh, the question is, how much do you see of it? Uh, if you let the grass grow, this is why it gets so green. Uh, this is the symbolic grass of forgetting. You can cover up everything. You don't see anything anymore. You, so it, it, it becomes, uh, it's far away. It's invisible. It's no longer there. But it's a matter, as was just said, of responsibility and um, also will and determination to uncover this story. And uh, for such a long period, there was no interest. And it took a second generation to actually start digging up. And, and the, 90, the 80s and 90s uh, paradigm was uh, uncovering of traces. You know, that was the, the job of the next generation after the long silence. And um, that is also how new places were created, not just in Berlin, but all over 
uh, the country, at, at least in, in Baden-Württemberg, where I live here, there are now 77 places like that. And it's all due to this uh, generation of the 68 people who said, I want to know what happened here in my neighborhood. And so it, it's always a matter of investing and uh, being engaged in the process. This is, by the way, at least part of the answer about uh, the role of social activism in the creation of these spaces, one of the questions I had in the Q&A. So we have now Monica Laura Perez and uh, Rika Bolke in the room who would like to ask about Colombia. Would Monica like to start? Yeah, buenas tardes. Uh, muchas gracias a todos por las presentaciones. Um, thank you for your presentations. And uh, I have a question to uh, Tatiana Luis. Um, I think it's accepted in Colombia that there is a conflict or um, many conflicts, but the discussion now is whether it is an armed conflict or a civil war. Uh, so that's in, uh, really the, the, the discussion now. And uh, I wanna, because you didn't even mention the work of the Truth Commission and the Justicia Especial para la, la Paz y, uh, and the difficulties they are facing. Is there a special reason for that? And the work of the Centro Nacional de Memoria Histórica in los últimos um, uh, last time is viewed very critically. What do you think about that? Thank you. Can we hear Rike Bolte, Bolte right, right after this? Is that okay, Tatiana? Yeah. Rike Bolte. Yeah, okay. Do you, do you hear me? Very good. Uh, okay, so, so my English is not so good. I, pre I would prefer to, to, to talk in Spanish, but I would try. So thank you very much for, for the event. Um, I wrote in, in my question that I, I entered late, so I don't know if this was um, exposed by Tatiana Luis, but I would like to know if you could say something about um, gender and memory in Colombia and also about ethnic ethnicity. Um, this is uh, the one part of my question. The other is if you could also just, uh, the colleague uh, talked about the term or use the term civil war. If you could also talk or say something about this term so I have to, to, I think about the term uh, Guerra Sucia in Argentina. So there was a discussion about this and perhaps you could say something about this and also about the relation um, between uh, memory and present. If you, um, you were uh, emphasizing uh, just the presence um, of the conflict in Colombia, and on the other side, we're talking about memory. So what's about the relation between this presence or presence of the conflict and memory? Thank you. Oh, that is a lot of questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I try to answer them briefly. So first of all, um, the, the question whether I didn't talk about the Justicia Especial para la Paz and the Truth Commission, that, that is a question of time. Um, we had a very limited time to, uh, to talk about uh, the different topics. And um, although I am very um, uh, conscious about the critiques the National Center for historical memory has received over the last years. Um, it is still, um, at least in the in the first years uh, before the change of the director, um, it is, um, I, I would say, uh, one of the most uh, important, if not the most important institution that has started at least the process of uh, investigating um, the reasons and the development of the conflict. Um, I agree that um, the, um, the role the center has, has um, receded a little bit with um, the Justicia Especial para la Paz, which is our, or which is the transitional justice system that is uh, working um, since a few years and the Truth Commission. Um, the work in general is not easy and um, that is due to, to the very uh, complexity of, of the conflict itself. Whether 
it is a conflict or a civil war. Um, well, this is a, a very broad discussion um, with uh, different positions. Um, I think uh, if we see that uh, from inside Colombia in general, we can say um, that civil war is a term that is reserved for the 19th century. If we look at how, for example, in, in, in textbooks for schools, uh, Colombian history is uh, narrated to children and, and um, young people. Uh, civil war is something that happens uh, when um, the form of government, uh, the, the way how the, the country is uh, governed uh, is not still is still not very clear. But at the moment where um, uh, it is felt that the state and the nation itself has consolidated, at that point, we don't speak of civil war anymore. That is uh, an observation you can you can make. Um, yeah, gender and memory, uh, ethnics and memory. Uh, um, there are many different aspects to the conflict that have to be taken into mind. Um, research is done. Different groups are involved. Um, it is happening, <laughs> and um, yeah, the relationship between memory and presence um, that that is actually that is a very in interesting question I think and um, I think the the closeness and time to what is happening interferes with the idea of memory because it's it's not a memory <laughs> it's something that is happening and um, because what the, the past is the presence and the future no, and uh, that makes so. Um, uh, Colombian historian Gonzalo Sanchez he called that circulated circle memories, where the past can be the present and the future, and our expectations are that the future is going to be as was the past. No, um, so um, yeah, we have we have this this problematic, and um, I think that is something that makes the Colombian uh, case very special. Thank you so much. I think that Daniel Rafikas wanted to come in on the question of the terminology, civil war. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, as, as he referred in, in my country in Argentina from the 70s until the 90s decades, the, ref, the referation of uh, the, or everybody refers uh, to the Argentinian case as the dirty war. And also, <clears throat> um, in, in those decades, the Argentinian case was referred with the, the phrase of the two demons, the two demons conflict, uh, trying to equiparate, trying to, to, to convert in equals the state terrorism with the activities, illegal activities of the left wing um, um, activists. But the, the, the further investigations, the judicial investigations, until these days, uh, concluded in a very clear way that that uh, phrases didn't wasn't wasn't exact was wasn't shape wasn't um, keen for describe the the facts. Uh, actually, the, the activities, the illegal activities of the right, of the left wing um, organizations was, were practically dismantled uh, in the, at, at the very beginning of the state terrorism. So the state terrorism deployed without an enemy. They only pursued civilian people, uh, students, workers, and um, the remains of that left-wing armed activists. So in conclusion, in my country, this kind of, of references as dirty war or two demons uh, are where and are and still are um, 
ways or attempts to legitimate or to rational rationalize the state terrorism. And in these last decades and today, in Argentina, is practically disappeared this kind of references uh, in order to address to the to the Argentinian case. Thanks. Thank you so much. Really interesting. We have now uh, three more people in the room with more general questions, and I think it might make sense to to hear first Stefanie Krämer and then Magdalena Zariuszwolska because I think they might gesture in the same direction or similar direction. Stefanie Krämer. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, I think all of you for the interesting presentations. So my question is, what role could technology and digitalization play for spaces of memory? Do you see it as a chance or a risk? Um, also, but not only in the background of young people as a target group. Thank you so much. And probably Magdalena Zariuszwolska right after. Um, yeah, my question goes in the same direction, actually, because um, many of your institutions are closed not right now due to the pandemic and you have to go online, probably. So do you consider the online memory work as effective as on site? What are the differences and um, does this affect your thinking about the relation between space and memory? Thank you so much. So yeah, Tomas and Alida Aspanesi, if there was you. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> definitely the pandemic affected our uh, ideas about uh, the education. And if before, I can probably say even a year ago, we believed that uh, being here on, on site is, is the best and probably almost the only way to educate in a proper, proper way. Uh, and today, uh, we decided to, to go deeply into online, online activities. Uh, so far, we have uh, certain uh, e-lessons and, uh, of course, e-study visits. But we are also introducing, uh, I hope that this will be launched in uh, like one or two, two months, also the online visit with with a guide who would go through the place uh and to give his uh, exp explanations to to to, to people sitting behind behind the, the laptops so um definitely the the, the current time and and the, and the pandemic changed completely our approach to to the, the technologies uh i must also say that um a few months ago, one of the Israeli companies offered uh, us uh, uh, that they will help us to, to, to make an a application that will also enable to, to, to visit Auschwitz at, at any time, even if the, if the site is, is closed. So we are also working, working on, on, on that. And um, we are definitely a little bit afraid of what the, the, the future will, will bring. Because uh, again, um, we we think that if somebody has a uh, has the opportunity, it would be best to to, to come here to, to 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 experience the site it, it itself, because it is uh, the most important part of uh, of our education philosophy to be here to experience to learn to learn in, in this place. But I think we do not have a, any other choice, and we have to go into um, uh, online uh, activities as well. Thank you. Alida Asman and after that, Elke Kretlewski. Or perhaps Elke first. Um, uh... Thank you, Alida. I'm absolutely with on Thomas' side that things changed, um, but at the same time, it also showed us where digitality cannot substitute the visit in the site because there is a limitation, that is the one point, and I, and I don't want to speak very long. And the second important aspect that we have to be keep in mind is that all these digital projects have to be developed in a very sensitive way, you have to be very careful because you move very fast also in the question um, of negotianism. 
there was a question before, you know, with digital methods, you can falsificate history and so on and so on. It's a huge topic. So it means, yes, it's a, it's a new and interesting possibility, but it really forces us to be very, very sensitive, very strictly. And it showed us where there is, uh, where the places cannot be substituted. I fully um, agree, and I would like to emphasize the possibility of combining online with offline. Um, and here I refer to an experiment or um, investigation that I did with a um, historian. Um, how do young people visit um, uh, places of, uh, of memory? And one of the ways they do it is that they <clears throat> take their cell phone along and they make photos. Um, and doing uh, these photos is a way to interact with the site. And then afterwards, it's not over, they don't just have a number of photos, they sit down and uh, make a kind of timeline and they choose a piece of music and they make, make a film out of the various uh, images and then they share this. And I think um, it, it can be very kitschy or tried or whatever, whatever but I think it is an active form of uh, recovering the experience and doing something with the site. And in this uh, sense, I think it is a creative form um, of sharing and therefore it should not be under uh, overlooked and un undervalued because uh, this is something and a tool that everybody carries along and can do something with actually. Yeah, thank you very much. It seems that we have somehow lost Santiago Lopez Alvarez but let me quickly sum up his question because it's a question that, re that is recurring. I've heard, seen that several times and that is about the quantitative side of all this. So is it possible to quantitatively measure what is the impact of such a memorial site? Or how many of the victims group really subscribe to what is being done there? Perhaps the panelists could just keep this in mind whether there's anything that you could say about quantitative uh, aspects of what you're doing. And while you keep this in mind, there are a few new people in the room now. And these are questions about the German case, or I guess Holocaust memory more general. We'll see. Uh, Hannah Grimmer first, perhaps. Thank you very much, Astrid. You can hear me, yeah. Perfect. Uh, first of all, I'm quite happy to see such a constellation of research as you can imagine. So yeah, my question points to this yeah, linked to the term as well of traveling memories. It's um, directed to Alada Asman, because given that the Nazis documented their crimes and they kept lists of when and where and how people were murdered, um, it's in quite a harsh contrast to the forced disappearance and the thousand cone, because there the people were abducted, the documents, passports, photos were destroyed, the bodies bur buried in the desert of Chile or thrown into um, the sea or the ocean. And the surviving relatives did not know what happened. And that's as well what um, at least one line of the Matas de la Plaza de Mayo that you mentioned as well are demanding, they are demanding the living reappearance, the apparition con via. So I wonder how do you bring these really different methods of killing people and these two different experiences for the relatives together under the concept of the spectral and Derrida's ontology? Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to answer directly? Yeah, thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, good to see you again or hear you again. Um, indeed, uh, we are comparing here something vastly different, the best documented uh, crime and the least documented crime. Uh, but uh, in terms of um, uh, the spectral turn and the ghosting um, and the haunting, I think there are great similarities uh, when um, uh, <coughs> Uh, in in Celan's Todesfuge, there's the line, um, um, 
da liegt man, also they're, they're buried practically, uh, the, the dead are practically buried in the, in the, in the skies. And uh, there is not, no narrow space for them. Uh, he refers to the invisibility and to the impalpability of that memory. It's, it's, it's the lo total loss of the person, even though there may be a lot of documentation, to, but at the end, uh, there is no way to direct and to focus your attention. You know, the, the idea of a gravestone is, is unthinkable in such a place. And therefore, I think the, the haunting quality is, is uh, rather similar. All right, thank you. Maximilian Gergens has a specific question. Uh, yes, thank you very much. My question also comes from the German context um, because sometimes there's a discussion popping up about making it, it uh, obligatory for German pupils to visit uh, concentration camps. So um, my question is, how do you think about that? Or more in general, how do you think about the possibility to oblige somebody to visit a memorial site? That's a question for Elke Kudlewski. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, I, I try to put this already into my presentation because I think it's a huge uh, ambivalence and not productive if um, people are forced in a very undemocratic way to go to places, uh, to memorial sites and learn democracy there. So that's one part. What I do think is that the whole discussion about forced visits in former concentration camp leads to a totally wrong discussion. Because um, if, if I think about young people, and I think it's not a criticism at all, we all were young. And when we were 16, who of us was really interested voluntarily in dealing with the past? No one, and not because we were stupid, but because we were young. So I think the first point is, yes, it makes sense to discuss the possibility that, that um, young people should be given the opportunity and not only young people, also adults should be given the opportunity to visit an historical site. That's the first step. The second step is then, how are these visits prepared? How are they integrated into educational contexts? How, how are they evaluated? And that is the point where we should invest our energies in, that the visit itself is a success in the sense that the visitors have the possibility to find a relation towards the topic and so on and so on. It's a huge um, topic, but really just to focus always on the question forced visits of memorial sites leads us, in my opinion, in the wrong direction. Omash. Well, uh, I totally agree with Elke uh, Grigleski said. Uh, the choice, the possibility, but not forcing people, youngsters to, 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 to visit. We also had these discussions here, here in Poland. And um, I've seen that there was a question concerning the, the number of Polish visitors to, to, to Auschwitz Memorial. So we have we had over 300,000 a year. Uh, out of them, around 200,000 were students or, or, or pupils. Uh, so even though it's not oblig obligatory in Poland to, to, to visit any of the sites of the four former camps. So I just think that this uh, possibility is, is much, much more important because then both the teachers and students can choose if they want to come and, and not. And definitely the visit that comes from the, the willingness is, much, is just more fruitful than, than just be the visit that is somehow forced or, or imposed on, on, on youngsters. Thank you so much. We have now, I think, uh, an important question on the transnational dimension of all this. And this is Nancy al I'm not sure if that's pronounced properly. Let's see if her connection holds. Otherwise, I'll read it. Hello, can you hear me? First, Very thank you so much for the fascinating topic and all of your work. My question is for Frau Osman, but also for others, if they can uh, like contribute. 
can memorials also become a place for tra transnational memories? For example, in Buchenwald, there is this uh, block on the ground, which is always 37 degrees, to, and it has a name where the people were, so Algeria, Romania, and all this. And it also, it's an important representation of the intersections of Holocaust, colonialism, and nationalism. And nowadays, also, there are refugees and migrants uh, from uh, countries affected by war who visit Buchenwald or even other memorials to mourn their own experience and loss and the experience of trauma in, in their home uh, country. So my question is, is it possible or even wished for that Holocaust memorials acquire meaning that transcends the memory of the Holocaust, or even communicate with the memory of the Holocaust, but also has their own uh, memories, national memories or cultural memories. Thank you so much. Before you answer, dear Alida, and thanks for the for this question, I have to say that we have just four more minutes, and Thomas Fischer also will give some final remarks. So uh, we're now looking for very short answers. Yeah, but I, I will just emphasize how important your question is. I think this is a real a research and also for, for the practice of memory, something to kept, be kept in mind uh, for the future, to make these spaces more multidirectional in the sense of Michael Rothberg uh, to especially have a focus on, on migrants. And also uh, it was uh, called by Primo Levi, a kind of Babel, all those languages, people coming from anywhere. Uh, this is an emphasis that can um, uh, also create a new um, link or bond uh, for visitors com coming from, di from different places. Thank you very much for mentioning this. These uh, are uh, actually great uh, final words. Perhaps as there are two more people in the room, could I ask Noemi uh, Quagliati and Sara Alejandra Perez Gonzalez to ask your questions just in one or two sentences so that we can hear you too before we then have to wrap up? Noemi. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have a question for uh, Tomas uh, Michaldo and uh, it's about uh, the local community. So how the local community is dealing with the high number of visitors that are actually visiting the memorial and how you, you interact and you are able to um, uh, transmit this feeling of anxiety with this high number that you described. Thanks. Thank you. And Sarah's uh, question was also about Auschwitz, if I see this correctly. Uh, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, thanks for your presentations. Uh, could you please tell us about the dialogue between historians, Polish, German, Colombian, and the government during the construction of policies, uh, education, memory policies, and memory sites? Did the historians have an active role in that? Thank you. So um, answering the, the first question uh, concerning the, the local community and uh, a big number, big number of visitors here. The truth is that uh, about 95% of, of our visitors do not stay for longer time here, here in the town in, in Oświęcim. They just come from Krakow, which is the, the big city nearby. They visit. Uh, and then they immediately immediately come come back. Also, uh, if uh, many of, of the participants that definitely had, had visited Auschwitz, so they know that uh, the, the, the former camp is located rather in the outskirts of, of, of a town. So this means that most of the visitors do not really see the uh, the town the town itself, uh, which implies that in fact many of the inhabitants of of, of Oshvienchim, uh they just live by the former camp, but they don't really get, get involved. Uh, I mean, if they are in, in, in a high school, they come to visit, they pass by the place, but, but in fact, uh, uh, there is no big, I would say, interaction between the museum 
and let's let's call it the, the local local community. We also had some tensions with the uh, uh, with the township, with uh, but uh, today it's 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 much uh, much uh, uh, much calmer. Now, as for the second question, um, of course, um, probably many of the participants. Uh, had the feeling that we try to focus mostly on on the emotions, but what again, Mrs. Grugleski said, uh, it is also very important for us to deliver to our visitors some some knowledge. So it's not only the uh, the feelings, the emotions, but we try to keep the balance between these two things. I mean, the the knowledge, uh, information, and and the emotions. Um, I think the the best way uh, to to make this, to make them feel a little bit that an anxiety is the, um, just to make at the very end of the visit already in, in Birkenau, just to, 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 to ask uh, certain questions. Um, maybe just to use the quotation of, uh, the, of, uh, of the survivor I've mentioned before, Marian Turski, uh, just to tell them, okay, Auschwitz did not descend from the skies. It, it started at some point and maybe if you look around you, yourself, maybe you'll see that similar things are, are happening. We know that the patterns of, of the genocides are, are gen generally quite quite similar. Uh, so we, by this, by asking such questions, we just want our visitors to to, may, to feel a little bit less less comfortable after after such such a visit. Thank you very much to everybody. And Professor Fischer now has the final words. Yes. Thank you very much for still staying here. My uh, final task is to make some concluding remarks. I will do that very briefly because uh, time is running off and <laughs> well, uh, we, are, we were talking about the past and uh, the task has to do something with time, but uh, well, this time is now present. We have to, uh, to ch our challenge is now to finish this conference. So um, our conference was about spaces and memory, or should I say memory and spaces? We were just discussing about this, which word comes before, uh, is, is the first one. And uh, when we were organizing this conference, we uh, were also discussing this with uh, Aleida Asman, which gave us an introduction to this uh, topic from a theoretical and practical overview over 30 years of discussion and development of this very broad field of research. And well, um, I think, what we are were going to do was to approach um, how in different sites space was constructed through representation and through praxeological emphasis. And we did that too in a transnational dimensions and we did it uh, with several uh, case studies, as I should say, and as you might know, when you when we deal with uh, case studies, we are invited to make comparisons and look for analogies and differences. So that what has been happened this afternoon, I guess, and now I just would like to stress. Uh, six different results, six different points I picked out of this conference. Of course, there were, are many more, and as discussion has showed, we should extend uh, our discussion, really extend and uh, think about maybe a following up conference. So um, the first point I want to stress is um, or was addressed by Aleida Asmund that uh, among memory agents in Europe, the, the most important is the state. Whereas when we compare it to Latin America, and I can say it's not only when it comes to Argentina or Colombia, but also uh, um, relating to other Latin American countries, 
uh, one of the most or probably the most important agents are social movements. So what we see in Latin America is that in, uh, and this makes a difference probably at least to Germany, maybe not that much to um, Balkan states or Eastern Europe states. Um, we have agents who have to struggle for the truth related to the past. That's uh, one important uh, thing I, I would like to stress. So they want the state as a, an agent to address the past, but it's very difficult to, to influence the state. No? The second point I would like to stress is pedagogy. Um, we have heard the, the presentations of Elke Gligewski and Domas Michalgo about uh, Holocaust um, places and which have become sites. And uh, we, we have heard about how the approach to deal in a pedagogical way with the past is changing over time and changing with time. And even uh, people there like, like you both um, are trying to, to incorporate in your uh, um, education work new approaches. For instance, the virtual transnational community creation, which was addressed by Thomas Michalski. The third point, uh, which I would, uh, um, or which we should keep in mind, in my point of view, is that uh, memory and spaces themselves are changing. No? Um, it's easy to say that, but uh, to conceptualize it and in a meta methodological way is not that easy, as I know as a historian. The fourth point is about visitors. And uh, I was struck by uh, this uh, point uh, made by uh, Thomas Michalski that we sh visitors should become agents. Yes, but how? And uh, we should work more about this, I guess. And my fifth point relates to the presentation of Daniel Rafekas, which shows us that justice and judges um, are more than just instances to do justice, to establish the truth and spell sentences. He said, well, we should be mediators. That's a, 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 an approach which could be well accepted by um, um, social sciences. As, no? I really, um, I, I was glad to hear that from you. Very interesting point. And uh, my sixth and final point is uh, a question. <laughs> the question addressed by Tatiana Luis, how can we remember the past when the past has not gone? No, the violent past has not gone. And it's not easy to find the, the answers, but we can study the practices um, which and and manifold practices we, we can observe in the in a country like Colombia, but probably we could do the same in African countries or in countries of the Near East, I guess. So um, this reminds us once again that doing memory is important to construct peace processes, to give a, a, an impulse to peace peace uh, processes. So these are my final closing remarks. And now um, I should thank the, the authors of these presentations we had here very, very much. Thank, give the thanks to the audience, having been stood here all the time and participated in discussion. And we hope to see you soon, but hopefully in presence in another format. <laughs> I hope. So that's uh, what I wanted to say. Stay healthy and safe. Goodbye from my side. And now I would like to give the last word to Dorothee Weidberg.
really the last, last final words. We uh, now would like to close the webinar. I think it was very successful and um, we wish you a healthy and happy year uh, 2021. And um, we hope that you can face the next maybe difficult months in Germany and Latin America and Poland um, with uh, patience and with confidence and a positive thinking. Thank you very much for this excellent event. Bye-bye.